Good morning. Welcome back. We are now at John chapter 16. And in this chapter, we will see the conclusion of the upper room discourse, which Jesus uh, delivered even to his own disciples. And even as Jesus was preparing for his uh, departure, he made two promises, or in other, or in, in other words, he, he uh, told them two things. First, he warned them of the coming persecution, and then he promised them the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the screen, uh, the breakdown for this chapter is uh, just three sections. The work, work of the Holy Spirit, verse 5 to 15, and then sorrow turning into joy, verses 16 to 24, and then Jesus Christ has overcome the world, verses 25 to 33. So, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word preserved for us. And I know that each and every time that we open up our Bible, you will open up your mouth and speak to us. And once again, we will uh, await the truth and the revelation as we go through verse by verse, asking, Lord, that you speak to us and teach us for our edification in Jesus name amen so we look at uh, chapter 16 verse 1 and Jesus said these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble they will put you out of the synagogues yes the time is coming when uh, that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things that they will do to you because uh, they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So Jesus was giving them a warning. And to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And this was in preparation uh, for Jesus' departure. Before he leaves, he warned them, there will be persecution. So verse 1, these things I have spoken to you. So what are these things? These, these are the words of Jesus Christ. These, these are the words of God. So this word of God, even as we behold before us in our hands daily, uh, that you should not be made to stumble. So, the word of God will keep you from falling away, just as the word of God shall keep these disciples from falling away, from stumbling. So, we need to treasure this word and take in this word each and every day and walk according to the word and we shall not stumble. So the possibility of stumbling is there. It is, is present even for the disciples. That's why Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that you, you, the apostles, should not be made to stumble, to fall away. So likewise for us, the possibility is there, but the word of God will keep you from stumbling. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes. The time is coming. And, and for the Jews, as we have studied, for the Jews to be put out of the synagogue is really, really very, very uh, 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 unacceptable. Because uh, it is not something that they will just accept so easily because it means a breaking of membership uh, it, from the rest, from the synagogue, and also fellowship with others. So you're totally ostracized. But Jesus was preparing them and he warned them. And even in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, and what did Paul warn us? Or at least he warned Timothy first in his writing. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, not may suffer, will suffer persecution. 
And Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 10. Uh, this is the Beatitudes, and Jesus told his disciples, told those who were listening, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is, the, is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So it's not exactly a bed of roses as many promise you uh, that once you accept Christ, it is a straight way, straight path all the way to heaven. No, there shall be persecution. And we are overcomers and we need to endure and we need to overcome. And we will learn more about this as we go on. In verse 2, they will put you out. Chapter 16, verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogues, excommunicate you. And uh, who will be persecuting you? Mostly and the, the, they are the religious leaders who will be persecuting you. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And he, he, whoever persecutes you will think that he is doing God a favor. He is serving God. Now, uh, we just need to look at the first martyr, uh, Stephen, or they call him Stephen. And, you know, even as he testified for Jesus Christ, uh, he, he, he was still met with resistance. And for that, after they heard him, they cast stones at him. So, in, in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, verse 54, when they heard these things from him, they were cut to the heart. They, they didn't accept the testimony uh, of Jesus by Stephen. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they, they these religious leaders, then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And who is this Saul? Later, uh, uh, his name was changed to Paul, the great evangelist, the apostle. But he was first a persecutor. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. But he suffered persecution. Okay, we look at uh, Acts chapter 7. Uh, no, sorry, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, the first three verses. Oh, we missed that. Yes. Okay. Now Saul, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was in Jerusalem, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And Saul and other religious leaders were thinking they were doing God a great service. They need to get rid of these lawbreakers, thinking that the Christians were the lawbreakers, but in fact, they were the lawbreakers. So back to... John chapter 16. 
verse 4. And, okay, let me read verse 3. And these things they will do to you. And these things, this uh, 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 persecution that they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Not that they do not know the Word of God. They knew, but they just don't have uh, the intimacy uh, with God. They do not know. They did not know God. And standing before them, Jesus, they did not know. And I've shown you this before in previous study. Um, this, you can go back and you can look at the, uh, the list of all the apostles and, and how they how their lives were ended. They were, they all had uh, uh, ugly death, except for John. John uh, died at a good old age of I think 100 or so, but the rest were crucified, they were stabbed, they were sawn in two, they were thrust with spear, and they're all on this page. So you can go back and uh, look at them. So, Verse 3, chapter 16, And these things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So, persecution is to be expected. So truly, it is taking up the cross and following Jesus daily. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. When Jesus was with them the last three years plus, He did not say this to them because Jesus was present and Jesus was protecting them. And who could be more powerful than the omnipotent Lord Jesus? He is God. They can't touch him. Even Jesus, when he went into the temple and he chased out all the money changes, he single-handedly displays all these lawbreakers. He is powerful. But now that he is living, he had to prepare his disciples, his apostles. And so he told them, Be warned, there shall be persecution. So now we come to the second part of this uh, um, chapter, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit, again, it is not the, the first time, I think it's uh, the, the fourth time. The third time was in chapter 15, verse 26. Uh, but now Jesus again, no, and now Jesus again uh, told them the Holy Spirit is coming. So, Verse 5, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? And if you read the original text, where are you going? It means, how are you doing? How are you doing? You see, no, no one was concerned for him uh, because they were preoccupied with themselves. They, they were sad. Right? As we studied even last week, at the end of chapter 14, they were sad that Jesus was going away. And then we came into chapter 15, and, and all that the, the Lord Jesus told them. I mean, it's like, Jesus, you are leaving. Then who, what else do we have? Who else do we cling to? I mean, who else will protect us? And, and where is our hope? Uh, uh, we, we want to see deliverance. And, and they were still looking forward to physical deliverance, that Jesus will be the physical, political Messiah. But He wasn't to be. He came as the spiritual Messiah. So, they were a bit uh, unsettled. So, they were, they were more focused on their own uh, needs than upon Jesus. And, and Jesus said, but now I go away who sent me and none of you ask me how am I doing? None of you ask me where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. You are sad that I am going away. Verse 7, Neverthe Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient as in some Bible would 
use that word it is to your advantage that i go away for if i do not go away the helper the holy spirit the comforter the parakletos will not come to you but if i depart i will send him to you this is the fourth time jesus is telling them or at least in this book of john and when he has come he will convict the world of sin and notice it is singular it is not s okay he will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment so and jesus the great teacher went on to explain what is sin and what is righteousness and what is judgment so he will convict the world of sin so verse 9 of sin because they do not believe in me the holy spirit will come and convict this people of what of sin sin of what this is singular it is the sin of unbelief that you did not believe that jesus came to die for your sins and if you look at mark chapter 10 verse 45 Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. We are all in bondage. We are all in captivity. We need to be rescued. And a price needs to be paid before we are rescued. And then, here comes Jesus. And He paid the price for us. He paid it with His life. And that, if you do not believe, that is the sin of unbelief. And the Holy Spirit will come. And the Holy Spirit will come as promised because even in the Old Testament, it was promised. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, uh, the, the, the prophet wrote, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that is the old covenant not according to the old covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the head and, and, and to lead them out of the land of Egypt my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them says the Lord but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the Old Testament days. Says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the heart, from the least of them, to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, not sins, their sin, what sin? Sin of unbelief. And their sin, I will remember no more. So the Holy Spirit, now that Jesus is going away, and when, has, when Jesus has gone away, the Holy Spirit will come and now convict the people of sin the sin of unbelief right so next of righteousness of righteousness because i go to my father and you see me no more because i go to my father and what is going to my father it means resurrection it means ascension so resurrection after death and followed by ascension because i go to my father and you see me no more and jesus will not be around to teach righteousness so in his place who will take over that role and that is the holy spirit in each and every believer and let me show you romans chapter 4 verse 19 Romans chapter 4, verse 19. And 
Paul wrote, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, referring to Abraham, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. He believed in God. He believed in God's promise, Abraham, and was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So, this, and uh, where am I? Yeah. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to who? To Abraham for righteousness because of his faith and his belief in God. Verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone, so it's not only for Abraham's sake, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. So this righteousness imputed to Abraham was not only for him, but also for us. And even as Paul wrote, he was a believer and he said us, us. That means all believers in Christ, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead. So if you believe that God raised up Jesus from the dead, righteousness is imputed in you just as it was to Abraham and to Paul and the believers who was delivered up resurrection, who was delivered up because for our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So, that's why now you read, now if you, I mean, when you read John 16 verse 9, you will then understand uh, of righteousness, verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father. We just read. If you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, then righteousness is imputed in you. So the Holy Spirit will impute that upon you. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Ascension back to heaven. Next, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judge satan has been defeated now jesus jesus spoke as if the victory has already been won and and which as we go through this chapter you will see he speak forth not that it might happen he speak forth as if the event had already taken place the ruler of this world is judge. And when Jesus raised from the dead, he has overcome the last enemy, which is death. And death got no more sting, got no more power over us. And by this, the devil is defeated. But it is an event that will take place a few hours later. Not yet, but in God's kingdom in his economy it has already taken place because the ruler of this world is judged but now as we look back they, jesus was speaking forth but now two thousand years later we are now reading this and we are looking back amen the the the, the satan the, the ruler of this world has already been judged Satan is now on death row. He is waiting for the final execution when he shall be thrown into the lake of fire. And for that, we have to go to the end of the book of Revelation. But until then, he is on death row. So don't join him. Don't join him. The Holy Spirit will convict you that, you know, you fear so much of the devil and, and, and what he will do to you. Fear not because he's on death row. He is condemned. Don't join him. Join the victor, the, the victorious one, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment because the devil, 
the, the, the Satan has got no more hold on you or us. We are free in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Still, he got many things to say to them. So in verse 12, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So, knowledge will be uh, revealed. I mean, the gain and the growth in knowledge will be progressive. And God and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will reveal the right amount of truth to us at the right time. When you can receive it, it shall be revealed to you. So I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of Truth, in Him there is no lie. Right? We studied this last week. However, when He, the Spirit of Truth, has come. And there are a few things that the, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, will be doing. And, and we, we will look at, I think, about seven of them uh, that describe the Holy Spirit what he will do. So let's look at the first one in verse 13. Number one, first the Holy Spirit has come. However, when the when he, the Spirit of Truth, has come. In fact, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, had been around even in the Old Testament. We have studied that. But it came upon those servants chosen by God for a specific occasion or task like King David, King Saul, right? Uh, but not on everyone. But at Pentecost, in the upper room, the Holy Spirit came upon every believer and thereafter. So again, Jesus is speaking as if it has already happened. So however, when the Spirit of Truth, number one, has come, okay, second thing is, He will guide you into all truth he will guide you into all truth and this will be all truth everything related to the good news everything related to our salvation that is the truth that the holy spirit will guide even these disciples these apostles even in their preaching and even in the writing of the New Testament books. And for that, we are grateful. Because humanly, how much can we remember? Even as we read all this, the, the conversation that took place, the, the, the prayers and, and all the miracles, it was the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles even as they pen their, their memories, their experience into words. And he, secondly, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority. So that is number three. The Holy Spirit will not speak of his own authority. So what does it mean? He will not speak of himself. He will not speak of, him, of himself because all he does is to point to Jesus Christ. Number four, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will speak only the truth. And whatever he hears, he will speak. In other words, he will not manufacture anything. He will not compose anything of his own. Whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak. So, that's number four. And then he will come. He will tell you things to come. And he will tell you things to come. That is number five. And he will tell you things to come. These are prophetic events. These are things that will happen in the future. Like for example, how do we know about the rapture? That in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, when the trumpet sound, you know, all those who are dead in Christ shall rise up first and, and those who are, of us who are still alive will be caught up in mid-air to meet the Lord in the air. How did Paul know to pen down all this? 
it is by the Holy Spirit. So, even the future events, the Holy Spirit will tell us, and that it points to the deity of the Holy Spirit. So we have the deity of God, we have the deity of Jesus Christ, and see, now we have the deity of the Holy Spirit. Of course, He is part of the Godhead. So this is the fifth thing. The Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. And verse 14, He will glorify me. He will glorify me. That is number six. He will glorify me. Not glorify Himself. He will glorify Jesus. So, some people, they like to hold a conference and, 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 and uh, crusades and say, this is the Holy Ghost moment. And everything is... Now, the Holy Ghost is not here to uh, uh, demonstrate and, and, and exhibit and proclaim Himself. He will not. All glory belongs to Jesus and to God the Father. And He... He will not glorify Himself. He will glorify Jesus Christ. That is number six. For He will take what is mine and declare it to you. He will take what is Jesus and declare it to you, to the uh, uh, apostles even so, to us as disciples. And that is number seven. And all these things would be found in the precious word of God. So if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, yes. Okay. So, happy is the man, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 13, happy is the man who finds wisdom. Yeah. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And wisdom is found even in the word of God. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and again than fine gold. So by gaining wisdom, gaining understanding, they are of greater value than silver and gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Wisdom, wisdom, and wisdom is found in the Word of God. And how do we receive this? Through the Holy Spirit. And that's why we just read in John chapter 16, verse 15. All things that the, no, verse 14, He will glorify me. He will think what is mine. And Jesus is the Word. Jesus is wisdom and he will take what is mine and declare to you, to us. That is our privilege. The, 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 the man of the flesh will never understand this, will not receive this. But we can. We are of the Spirit. We are of Christ. So, this verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So, all things, what are this? All the treasures of God's truth, even as they are found in the word of God. All these treasures that are Jesus. So, Jesus is again claiming deity, equal with God, being equal with God. All things that the Father has, are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine, and this is the Holy Spirit. So you see the Trinity here, even in this verse 15. So all things that the Father has are mine. Jesus is the Son. Yeah. And therefore, I said that he will take of mine. So Jesus, whatever Jesus has will be uh, delivered from and by the Holy Spirit from him to us. And he will take of mine and declare to you. You see, the Trinity at work is so wonderful. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It is so awesome. It is so indescribable. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 
But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. If what you see on earth is great, you do not know what is awesome. So what God has prepared for us, it is wonderful. And even so, even so, as you walk the walk of faith here on earth and with the Holy Spirit working in and through you, we see that He will guide you in all truth. Yeah? He will not speak of His own authority. Whatever He hears, He will speak. He will tell you of things to come. He will not glorify Himself, but Jesus. Yeah? Uh, he will take what is Jesus and declare to you, to us. It's just so wonderful. And so, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Next, we come to the section on the sorrow turning to joy. Sorrow will turn to joy. Again, if you remember, uh, these this people, these disciples, these apostles before him, they were a bit sad. Sorrow has filled their hearts, uh, even as we read in verse 6. So, Jesus is uh, going to assure them, going to encourage them, even from verse 16. A little while, and you will see, you will not see me. And again, a little while, you will, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Let me read again. In verse 16, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. So we look at the first part. A little while, you will not see me. Why? Because of Jesus' death. Jesus' death on the cross. So they will not see him. Shortly, they will not see him. In fact, it is only a few hours away. And they will not see him. Sorrow will indeed fill their hearts then. And again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. Now, many have thought that uh, the first a little while is because of his death so they will not see him and then the second part and again a little while and you will see me and they were referring to this of uh, uh, first corinthians chapter 15 uh, when jesus made his resurrection appearances because after he was resurrected he did appear he did appear uh, to the disciples and so you look at verse uh let, let me just read from verse 3 for i was delivered first corinthians chapter 15 for i delivered to you first of all that which i also received first corinthians 15 verse 3 that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen, verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter. Then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. That means there, there are people who were still alive, people who saw the resurrected Christ at the point of writing, of Paul's writing. But some have fallen asleep, some have died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So, these are the uh, resurrection appearances. But was that what Christ was referring to in John chapter 16? I don't think so. We read the full verse. A little while you will not see me so you know this this is because he died so for that uh, 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 Friday Saturday they saw him not and again a little while you and you will see me 
But you must finish the sentence, because I go to the Father. Because I go to the Father, because I go to the Father, this is not just uh, about resurrection, but it's more than resurrection, it is ascension back to the Father. So, and because I go to the Father, and you will see me, eh? How so? If he ascends back to the Father, how to see him? You will still not see him. Now, then I want to uh, uh, show to you, in the la timeline of eternity, in the timeline of eternity. So, when Jesus died at, on the cross, so and he was buried in a cave, so in that little while, they did not see him. Then after that, he, on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And then, subsequently, he ascended back to the Father. Now, that period, that period is insignificant, is very short compared to the timeline of eternity. So, that little while should include not only Jesus' death on the cross, but also his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. But, again, after that little while, after that little while of death, resurrection and ascension, he, you will see, we will all see Him because I go to the Father. So Jesus has gone to the Father. Then when He comes back to take His church to be where He is, we will see Him again for all eternity. That's why He said, again a little while. So this again a little while wasn't referring to the resurrection appearances, but it meant the time between His death and his ascension, that period is just a little while. And again, a little while, yeah, a little while, it could be 2,000 years later, like right, right now, after his uh, ascension, or it could be a bit longer. And then Jesus will come and take us home, and we will see him again. And that 2,000 or more years is nothing in comparison with the time of eternity and so that's what jesus meant a little while and you will not see me and again a little while okay so and you will see me so that's when he shall come back he shall come back first the rapture and then the second coming of christ because i go to the father i hope you are able to follow me on this okay so if you can't, it's okay. We are still friends. Uh, let me point to you, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. Yes. The author wrote, For yet a little while. For yet a little while. That means, when, when the author wrote this, Jesus has already gone back to the Father. We, we like the church. I mean, we are like them. They are like us. We are just waiting for Jesus to come back again. And the author wrote, For yet a little while, he and he who is coming will come and, not, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So don't, don't give up. Be an overcomer. Okay, the just shall live by faith. But verse 37, For yet a little while, but Lord, it's been 2,021 years, but yet in a little while. Yeah? It could be a bit longer or much longer, I don't know. But yet it is a little while in comparison with the timeline of eternity. And he who is coming will come and will not carry. That's what it means. Okay, so, um, back to verse 17. John chapter 16, verse 17. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. 
you know what they were having? A disciples conference. And so these disciples gathered amongst themselves, hey, what is he talking about? A little while you will see, a little while you will not see me. What is he saying? And they were just, I guess, a bit too embarrassed to ask Jesus. They were too embarrassed to admit their ignorance to Jesus. But these are real men. These are human. These are the, the chosen apostles, disciples who have followed Jesus for the last three years. These were real men with real questions. So let me tell you, even the greatest church leaders in the world, the greatest evangelists and whoever, we all still have questions. I may study in the Bible all these years, but I still have questions. And the best thing to do is when you have questions, ask Jesus. That's all. But these people were having their own conference and they were asking each other as if they, amongst them, they could find the answer. I could understand their, 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 their situation because they... The event hasn't taken place yet. They, they were looking forward, but for us, we have the benefit of the past event. By now, Jesus had already gone to the cross. He, he had already died and he, he was buried and then he, he resurrected and he ascended back to heaven. So we are looking back. But for these disciples, they were puzzled because they were looking forward and they had no knowledge like we do. So, we do not know what he is saying. Now, Jesus, verse 19. Jesus knew, of course, he is omniscient, he is God. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, but they dare not. That they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you will see me most assuredly i say to you you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy a woman when she is in labor has sorrow because her hour has come but as soon as she has given birth to the child she no longer remembers the anguish, you know, the birth pangs, the contractions, the pain. For joy that the human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Therefore, now you have sorrow. This is brief sorrow, as I have entitled this chapter. Now you have got brief sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy, this is permanent joy, no one will take from you. So, Jesus was saying, I will see you again. Yes, yes. I will see you again after resurrection. So he made his appearances as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But then Jesus was going back to the Father again. So that is ascension. Yeah. About 50 days after, after that, he ascended back to heaven. No, not 50 days, but after that he ascended back to heaven. Yeah. Uh, then how? Then he got sorrowful again. No, but when he shall see them again, when he shall come for his church, for the body of Christ, and then our joy will be permanent. Not that our joy is not permanent, now it is, but it will be fulfilled totally and no one can take it from us. Yeah, so this was Jesus' explanation even to the disciples about a little while and a little while. And in that day, and in that day, so after Jesus has ascended back to heaven, and in that day, you will ask me nothing. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, what was Jesus saying? Jesus saying, after I've ascended back to heaven, okay, you go direct. You can call direct. Because until now, until now, I have been with you. Jesus had been with them. And they could just ask him direct. They had the they, they, they enjoyed his presence and they enjoyed the privilege of being in his presence. But he is going away. He is going away. Then how else do they direct their request when they have needs? And Jesus is saying, yeah, in that day, verse 23, in that day after ascension, and then with the coming of the Holy Spirit, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask, whatever you ask the Father, means go direct to the Father. No need to go through Jesus and not, no need to go through any other person or go through Mary or anyone. No need, just go direct. And in my name, in Jesus' name, not anyone else's name, in my name, in Jesus' name, He will give you whatever you ask the Father in my name. He will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. That your joy, even while you are here on the earth, that your joy may be full. So, this is the end of the second section of this chapter. We will take a break here and when we come back we will conclude with the last section of this chapter